Loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for, for being here with us, for loving us, for forgiving us. As we worship you today, I pray that your angels might gather around and join in our singing, join in our praise, and uh, help us to feel your presence in our heart, to know your presence in our mind that we may come closer to you and be more fit, more prepared for heaven. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I'd like to welcome you. Thank you for being here. It's a beautiful day outside. A little sparse numbers because the Pathfinders are away doing their PBE, Pathfinder Bible Experience. And uh, our prayers are with them for safe journeys, but also as they uh, experience and share what they have been working on for the last few weeks in answering questions, biblical questions, with a thus saith the Lord. And I pray that they may gain insights into being better people also, learn to grow as we all need to grow. We'd like to sing this morning our opening hymn. It's in your hymnal. It's number 412. Cover with his life. Let's stand as we sing. Glory 
find when returneth my Lord. Cover with his light, whiter than snow, fullness of his life, then shall I know. Than snow. Amen. Please be seated. It's time for us to participate with giving our offering, loose offering this morning. It's going to go for uh, our local budget. Like we were talking about back there, you can see the results of your offering right now. So enjoy, we can enjoy the benefits. In Acts 3.16 it says, And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So, praise the Lord. As we give, he gives us perfect soundness. I don't know about you, but I need that. We ask our deacons to come forward. Let's have our prayer. Father, once again, we thank you. Thank you that we can be here today. Thank you for the funds flowing through our hands that we can share. We know all things are yours. So we thank you for the privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Children's story time. We don't have any children, but we still have a story. We have one. Oh, you're hiding. Uh huh. We have one child. You want to come up and. Uh... Mary has consented to tell us children's story today. You hear? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a story about when I had told some stories about the first horse that I bought and what, I, what she taught me and what I taught her. But this is a story about the first time I got to take care of a horse. I had been praying and begging and all of that since I was seven years old to have a horse. I read every magazine, everything I could find out about horses I did. But when dad's, my dad's cousin said, well, why don't you take my cow pony and see if the kids take care of him, 
And if they really are serious about taking care of a horse, then you can consider getting a horse. So we brought Smokey from Eskridge, Kansas to Topeka, Kansas, and had a big barn and place to keep him. We had a, a little tack room where we could go in the wintertime and, and get warm, put our our boots up and sizzle from the snow and, you know, on a big potbelly stove. Well, I had been taught that he would bloat up when you put the saddle on. Do you know what that means? It means he holds his breath and he, he, he gets his stomach all, all big. So when you put the cinch on and you pull it up tight, he, when he let it out, guess what happened? That cinch got loose. <laughs> and I had been told about that. I'd read about that, but I had never done it before. And so when I thought I had it good and tight, guess what? When we were riding along, and this, this barn happened to be by a new highway, a new freeway that we had put around our town. And luckily it was new. Uh, but we were riding along along the side, well away from the, the lanes, and all of a sudden he just jerked. I don't know if he got spooked or if he was doing a cowpony thing. Anyway, guess what I did? Guess what that saddle did? <laughs> it went like this. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I am, uh, I'm holding his reins, but I, I'm dragging, and he's... He's running towards the highway, <laughs> and I'm, I'm holding on, <laughs> like I'm thinking I'm going to get him stopped, <laughs> flopping around down below. Finally, as we're going on the lanes in the middle of the traffic, I, I figured out I had to let go. And then I worried, with, well, this is a new place. Where's he going to go? But he went straight back to the barn. He was fine, and <laughs> I was shaken, but... I learned that sometimes knowledge up here isn't the same as, you know, learning physically what to pull up the, that cinch. Anyway, so when, when somebody teaches us something or a book teaches us or a magazine, it's not until we experience it and get this experience of others that can really, really give us the, the knowledge <laughs> of how to do. But God protected me. I wasn't hurt. I was sore and I had a few scrapes and stuff but I was safe God is good but anyway so that's that's my story father in heaven I pray that everything that we learn that we can apply and and be forewarned of possible dangers keep us safe keep us wise and keep us always listening to your voice in Jesus name I pray amen 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 thank you time for the Lord to come. I hear the people say, the stars of heaven are growing dim. It must be the breaking of the day. The signs foretold in the sun and moon in earth and sea and sky, a loud proclaim to all mankind, the coming of the Master draweth nigh. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day, oh, it must be the 
the breaking of the day. The night is almost gone, the day is coming on. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. It must be time for the waiting church to cast her pride away. With girded loins and burning lamps to look for the breaking of the day. Go quickly out in the streets and lanes and in the broad highway and call the maimed, the halt and blind to be ready for the breaking of the day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. The night is almost gone. The day is coming on. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. kneel as we seek the Lord as a church family in prayer. Father, we thank you for this Sabbath day, Lord, and this opportunity to worship together. Lord, we pray that you would be present, Lord, that you would be blessed by our worship and song and giving, returning, Lord, and opening your word. We ask, Father, that you hear our prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus, Lord, that, that as we come to you, we bring only our need, we bring our confession, Lord, we have sinned. Have mercy on us. We ask, Father, that by seeing you, as the song says, Lord, that we would be transformed by your power, Lord, to more fully reflect you coming into the, Lord, the, the full image, Lord, of Christ, Lord. Prepare us for translation. Lord, we have lifted up our sick, Lord, our wandering to you. We ask, Father, that you would look into the depths of our hearts, Lord, and that you would shine your bright light of love, mercy, Lord, and truth, Lord, cleansing us of unrighteousness, Lord, and illuminating before us each in our own hearts, Lord, our own minds, those things which must be cleansed, Lord, must be purged out, Lord. We ask that uh, that you would be with the pathfinders today, Lord, bless them in their efforts, We're, Lord, as they seek to bring you glory, Lord, and sharpen their memories, Lord, for truly we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We pray a special prayer for Brother Clancy, Lord, anoint his lips and open our hearts and our minds, Lord, our spiritual eyes that we might see, that we might hear, and truly, Lord, having seen and heard, we might be changed. We ask that your Holy Spirit be poured out upon this church, that we be true and faithful to our high calling. Lord, we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Psalms 119, verse 165. When you get there, say, Amen. 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 119, verse 165. You'd be hard-pressed to find a chapter that has more verses than Psalms 119. Psalms 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We ask the Lord would bless the reading of his word and us. Brother Clancy. The desk is yours, Elder. That's what we all want is peace, right? We need peace. In today's chaotic world, it seems like there's anything but peace. But if we look to Jesus, that's where we find peace. And there's not just any peace, great peace. Great peace. All right. Introducing this, I've been told... That when I was growing up, I was creative. You were creative? Now the Lord made me, and he's the great creator, but I was told that. I was creative. However, I remember on my report card in grade school, more often than not, there was a note from my teacher that told my parents that I did not use my time wisely. (laughs) Now, most of my grades were pretty good, reading and writing and arithmetic, and I got excellent grades in art. But in science, there was usually a note saying, needs improvement. If I had been born 30 years later, I probably would have been labeled with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. At the time, though, they just talked about me being a bit scatterbrained or inattentive. They told my parents that I needed to learn how to focus. Well, this morning I'd like for us to focus and reason together. Isaiah 118 says, Come now, we all know this, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they will be as wool. I think that indicated in this text is a focus on the Ten Commandments. and a direct focus on obedience to those commandments. I say that that because in the very next two verses, Isaiah 1, verses 19 and 20, it says, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with a sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So we need to obey, but not that we can obey without God's help. But you know what? Help has been promised. Last week we looked, if you remember, at the onion. Compared looking at its layers to understand that there's more than just the surface meanings of the law. We found a deeper meaning to each precept in the Decalogue by examining Scripture and examining the meanings of the words used in the text. We looked at the last of the six commandments, which deals on how to improve our relationships with our fellow men. That study is a great weight, great importance. The words of God's law are most sacred because they are the words written by God's own finger on stone 
then copied by Moses and faithfully translated by dedicated scholars and scribes into our language with the desired goal of God having those precepts written in our hearts. Now this week's study carries even greater weight than last week's study because instead of exploring the horizontal relationships between people as we did last week looking at the last six commandments we will be looking at the vertical dimension found in the first four commandments dealing with our relationship with the almighty the holy god who is also the one who wants to be our closest friend our most intimate friend now he's proven that desire for us to be with him by giving us his only son who gave up his own life so that we could have the opportunity to choose to have a relationship with him he loves us loves us he wants us to be with him he wants to be with us let that sink in. He loves us. He wants us to live eternally in His presence. He wants it so badly that even though we sinned, even though we sinned, thank you, sister. I thought I might get thirsty, so I brought this along. Thank you. All right. He wants us so badly that he paid the price for our sins. He wants us with him for eternity. How can we help but praise him? He is so good. He wants us not just to be his neighbor. Will you be my neighbor like Mr. Rogers? He wants to live, wants us to live in his house. He wants a holy, intimate relationship with me and with you. Imagine that. He wants us to be his family, physically together in heaven. So how can a sinner like me have the courage to stand up here in front of you and share these precious precepts, these divine directives? How can I do that without help? I'm not a man with a gift of gab, like some folks seem to have. How can I present these weighty words? Well, Zechariah 4.6 gives me the answer. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will touch me. Touch these unholy lips, the sinful body. Purify me. Forgive me of my sins. Use me as you will. Speak through me today. And may your Holy Spirit not only touch me, but touch the ears of each listener so that they may receive your words, not mine. And if I say something amiss, just cover their ears or shut my mouth. But if I say what is right, I pray that we might each receive it so that we may be better prepared to be the obedient citizens of heaven when you come in your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we're looking at first four commandments we found that in exodus right exodus 20 starting with verse 3 most of you have it memorized i'll bet thou shalt have no other gods before me i would like to suggest 
that we're living in a polytheistic society. I've heard that there are many so-called gods in the world. But I wanted to find out just exactly what a god is, so I checked my, my thesaurus and I found several entries. Just what I expected. Supernatural being worshipped by people. An absolute being. They gave synonyms, listing names which most folks have included. They have heard knowing, all-knowing, all-powerful, Allah, divine being, Holy Spirit, Jehovah, King of Kings, Yahweh, the Almighty, the Creator. But I came across a couple of them that I wasn't sure about. In my thesaurus, I typed in God, and it said daemon, D-A-E-M-O-N. I didn't know what that was for sure. I had an idea, but I looked it up. It's spirit of the dead. Some people make spirit of the dead their god, a demigod, a demon. I couldn't believe these are listed as synonyms for the word God. Another synonym was Newman. I'd never heard of that word either. N-U-M-E-N, Newman. So I looked it up. Newman is a talent or an aptitude, an ability, an accomplishment, an acquirement, an endowment, an instinct, a propensity, or a specialty. I guess a person can make a god out of almost anything and worship about anything that they choose. We can make gods that are more intricate, more complex, such as automobiles. Some people love their automobiles. Maybe a piece of fine art or some complicated machinery. Some people make gods out of rock stars or movie actors or maybe even a spouse. I've heard that some men worship the ground that she walks on. Uh-oh, how about sports games? Uh-oh, you're going to meddling now, preacher. Or video games. Maybe I'm stepping on toes. I'm sure that we can make a God out of anything with which we spend more time than we spend with God. Allow me to suggest that making a God out of these kind of things and worshiping them will get us nowhere and get you nothing except disfavor from the true God. Not that he'll stop loving you, But you won't be happy. You won't find happiness in those false gods. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I've always understood that and still do to understand that. To mean that before means of greater importance. But another facet offered for your consideration this morning is the definition of before to mean in front of physically standing in front of, like in the presence of God. If we have any God, anything that we worship with us as we stand in God's presence, maybe we're guilty of violating this commandment. He stated that we must have no other gods before him. Could it be that as we are seen by the Almighty, standing in front of Him, if we have any God at all besides Him, we're transgressing the law and in need of forgiveness. I want to be sure that I'm doing my best to obey in every facet of God's rules, especially since eternity is my goal. And unconfessed transgression of God's law will keep me from reaching that goal. We should pray, Lord, please take away anything that I might worship other than you. Don't let me worship anything but you. Let's go to commandment two. Exodus 20, verses four to six. 
Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Any graven image, what does that mean? When I was growing up, I went to Sabbath school, and they showed me pictures depicting graven images that was mentioned in the second commandment those pictures were usually images of crude carvings out of wood or stone some animal or an elephant or a cow or maybe the likeness of a human seated on some chair that looked like a throne graven images that people worship can be more subtle though than simple carvings of wood and stone Somehow I really didn't change that perspective, though, until a few years ago when the telephone became an item that you could put in your pocket and carry around with you and spend a lot of time with your eyes glued to a little small screen at the peril of your very life, especially if you were driving a car, or the peril of eternal life if you make a god out of it. A lot of images come on this little tool that we call a telephone, a cell phone. Could we safely say that technology has become a god of many people? I hope and pray not us. Have no other gods before me. I would like to suggest for your consideration that we as sinful humans can make a god out of any idea, even our religion, even our doctrines. Some may even worship the Sabbath instead of worshiping the one who made the Sabbath for us. Some may even worship the Ten Commandments instead of worshiping the one whose finger wrote them on stone. It's all too easy to get entangled in the trap that Satan has so successfully ensnared so many sincere believers unless we stay on guard and keep our focus on the true God and get help from his Holy Spirit. Let's turn to John. John 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 4, verse 24. Somehow we need to make sure that we correctly delineate who or what we serve, what we worship, or how we serve, how we worship. We all know that we should worship only the Creator, but somehow we get caught up in the everyday life and get distracted, like me with ADHD. At least I do. John 4.24 tells us how to worship God. Here Jesus told the woman of the well, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what is truth? Well, in John 14, let's go over to John 14. Jesus told us what truth is. Not what truth is, but who truth is. Who truth is. He was with his disciples and had just told Peter that before the rooster crowed, Peter would deny him, deny that he even knew him. He was giving encouragement to all of them because he knew that his time had come to be betrayed. John 14, verses 1 through 6, we're going to read. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And here's the answer Jesus gave him. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He called himself the truth. Right there in verse 6 he said it. Worship God in spirit and in truth. Jesus is the way. He's not a graven image. He's the creator. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the savior of sinful souls. He's the redeemer of rebellious mortals. He's the soon coming king of kings. Soon coming lord of lords. He's not a graven image. Let's worship him. He's the only true God who came to earth to be with us and to build a bridge to take us to him. Okay, we've looked at the first two of the Ten Commandments. The first, having no other gods before the Creator. And the second, refraining from making images of anything and worshiping anything and serving anything other than the Creator God. So let's move on. Exodus 20, verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that take his name in vain. Now, this was touched on in, in uh, Sabbath school lesson study this morning. Ask any Christian what that means to them, and they'll probably tell you that we oh shouldn't that we shouldn't curse. We shouldn't swear. I agree with that. That's the first layer of understanding. We should not say God's name lightly. Many texts I see on social media ignore this command. All too often I see OMG exclamation point. Some other acronym may be taking God's name, his holy name as an exclamation or a byword. God is holy. His name is holy. When speaking his name or referring to him, we should use reverent tones. When texting, we should show utmost respect. We should never use his holy name in jest or in insincerity. You know, many people in ancient Israel wouldn't even speak his holy name because they considered themselves unworthy to have such a name a name so holy even pass through their sinful lips and when writing about him the Israelite scribes were so careful with his holy name that they would write the word Lord in all caps capital L O R D instead of the name Y H W H Yahweh translated today as Yahweh whatever your belief is and how to say his name, I think we can agree that we need to show great awe, the highest esteem possible when we talk to him or about him. He's so far above us in perfect love and perfect wisdom and perfect power that we as mortals created by him owe him much more than we can ever pay in respect, and in love. But we're looking at the outer layer. Let's look a little deeper. When we peel away that outer layer, outer layer we see revealed a deeper level of understanding. We call ourselves Christians, right? Part of that word is Christ. By taking on that name, we are proclaiming to the world that we are followers of the Lamb of God. 
And we have lots of books in the New Testament giving us instruction on how to reflect his character. And if you study the Old Testament, you'll find it there too. So allow me to ask the question, would we be taking Christ's name in vain when we don't reflect his character the best that we possibly can? Several years ago, I was talking to Kent, an old friend of mine from high school, and he was telling me that he refused to, to put any signs on his car that indicated that he was a Christian because he was afraid that in some weak moment he might break the law, like if he was speeding in a hurry or, or maybe he was provoked enough he may yell at somebody that cut him off or some such thing. And he did not want to wish, he did not wish for anyone to think that a Christian would do such a thing. He said he didn't want the name of Christ to put in a bad light. I understand that reasoning. But I still left the tag on the front of my car that says, In God we trust. But now, I feel like I must do my best to obey the traffic laws. And I do my best not to let road rage get the better of me. I don't want anyone to think that a follower of Christ would do things like that. There are multiple layers of this commandment that covers practically every facet of life, public or private, how we interact with everyone we meet, how we handle every situation with friends, business associates, when buying groceries or filling up with fuel. When anyone sees me, if I'm not reflecting the character and love of God, am I showing them that I take the name of Christian, the name of Christ, seriously? Or do I do something where I wish for them to just remain ignorant that I follow Jesus? Am I ashamed of the gospel of Christ? We need to each ask ourselves that. And the answer should, should, should be, I certainly hope not. But you know, our actions speak much louder than words. How much better is our testimony if our actions emphasize the truth of our words rather than detract from truth? I pray that we all can say with the Apostle Paul, where he said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. I hope I'm preaching to the choir, folks. Amen. On to the fourth commandment. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. It's, this one is the longest of the Ten Commandments. And it is the only one telling us to remember Let's read it over, then look at it more closely. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days... The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Starting with the first word, remember, obviously indicates that someone forgot. It had been known before. In fact, the Bible record shows that this command originated here on earth on the last day of creation week. We read in Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day 
and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. Ever since creation, there's always been a small group who are called sons of God. They obeyed God. Genesis 6, 5 tells us, though, that there was another group, the sons of men who did evil. It says that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Then verse 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. The phrase walked with God tells me that Noah and God were friends. So he was probably a Sabbath keeper. He remembered what most others had forgotten. Let's go forward to chapter 12. After the flood, there also remained a remnant who served God. This tells about Abram. It tells about the conversation between the Lord and Abram. Now, when two people are having a conversation, it's a good chance they're friends. Abram was a just and godly man, therefore was probably also a Sabbath keeper. We follow his offspring to Isaac and Jacob, who was renamed Israel. You remember the story. Israel's son Joseph came to power in Egypt just before the famine that brought his family to live in Egypt. They were fruitful, they multiplied, and over a few generations became a nation. I read that they were somewhere between two and three million people at the time of the Exodus. Exodus 1 tells us that they were forced into slavery because the Egyptians were grieved or in dread because of the numbers of the children of Israel. They were forced into slavery, and as slaves, they somehow forgot the precepts which their forefathers had followed. Then Moses was raised up by God to be used to miraculously free the Israelite slaves so that they could worship the true God in their, as, their far, as their forefathers did. Moses was successful. He took the children out into the wilderness, right to Mount Sinai, where Moses was directed by God to meet him up on the mountain. And that was where God wrote those Ten Commandments that we're dealing with. He wrote them with his own finger on tables of stone. We have a saying today, written in stone, it means it's permanent. It doesn't go away. He was addressing this group of people, descendants of Jacob, who had been forced into slavery for generations. Could it be that they had forgotten the Sabbath day? So God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember, don't forget the Sabbath. The Sabbath, I looked it up in Britannica from the Hebrew word Shavat, to rest. The seventh day of the week, commemorating the original seventh day on which God rested after completing creation. That's what I read in Britannica.com. Remember to keep it holy. What does holy mean? Sacred. Set apart. Undefiled. Don't forget the Sabbath, the seventh day, honoring the day that God rested after creating the world by setting it apart as an undefiled, sacred day. Going on, in it thou shalt not do any work. We have six days to do all the work that we need to do to stay alive in this world. But the seventh day is one that we want to refrain from doing all those secular tasks. Jesus showed us how to keep the Sabbath. This is a day to spend with him doing the kinds of things that he did on the Sabbath while he lived here as a man. Who all is supposed to do this? Going on, thou 
nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. Now, nowadays, some of us, or most of us, have sons and daughters. Not many have manservants and maidservants, do we? Or do we? Isn't there usually servers, men servants and man servants at restaurants where we go to eat? Or when we go to buy shoes at a shoe store, someone comes and, what size would you like? And they'll go back in the back and get it for you and help you try it on. Anybody ever done that? A lot of times we just go to Walmart and pick it up. It used to be we had serve man servants and maid servants help us with our shoes. I'm thinking that probably, if at all possible, I shouldn't go to those places where men servants and maid servants wait on me. I'm sure emergencies will happen. But if possible, maybe I'm being fanatical, or maybe not. I would rather be considered a fanatic by skeptics, by being obedient in God's eyes, than not to be right with God and to appear normal to the skeptics. I don't want to take chances, not with eternity on the balance. I want to bless God. I want to make him happy and bring him joy. Chances are that the skeptics who claims that I'm being a fanatic by obeying God is probably a person that's not obeying God. But now the best part of the fourth commandment. This is the part of having the seal of God in our foreheads and in our hands. Any seal or agreement between two parties has three conditions or three qualities. First, it would have the name of the individual making the agreement. Secondly, it would have his title. Thirdly, it would have his domain. Such as, I, Clancy Blanchard, that's my name, executor, the title, of this estate, the domain, is required to do the following, blah, 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 whatever that agreement was. We find that it, in this part of the fourth commandment, there are all three of these conditions. For in six days the Lord, that's his name, made, his title is creator, heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, that's the domain. And then comes the reason for this agreement. He rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, made it holy. Turn with me to Exodus 16, just a few pages back from Exodus 20. Exodus 16, verses 22 and 23. Remember when the Israelites were in the wilderness and manna fell almost every day? The people would go out into the fields and gather it up, make cakes out of it. Exodus 16, verses 22 and 23. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, or boil, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept unto the morning. Tomorrow, this was the sixth day they were talking, tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Here we see that Sabbath day is a day of rest. Same idea is found in multiple other places. If you want to jot these texts down, I'm going to read them quickly. Exodus 31, 15. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Exodus 35, 2. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest 
to the Lord. Leviticus 23.3 says, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, an holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. There's many, many other verses that agree with that, say almost identical the same thing. What's it going to be like in heaven? Isaiah 66, 23 tells us a little bit of what it's going to be like. Isaiah 66, 23. I think that's the last chapter in Isaiah And it shall come to pass, verse 23, it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Maybe we can start enjoying a Sabbath right here and now, worshiping God in spirit and in truth now. That would be a joy. Sabbath is a joy. Proverbs 29, 18, the last part says, He that keepeth the law, happy is he. Amen. I want to be happy. In closing, I would like to read a few verses from Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26, verses 2 and 3 and 4. And then I'm going to jump to 6 and 12. Leviticus 26, verse 2. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, Then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And I will give peace in the land. And ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. I'd like to repeat our scripture reading today. Psalms 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Let's get our hymnals and turn to number 466. Wonderful peace, 466. Let's stand as we sing. Far away in the depths of my spirit a melody sweeter than song in celestial like strains yet unceasingly falls or my soul like an infinite calm peace peace wonderful peace coming down from the father above sweep over my spirit forever I pray in fathomless billows of love what a treasure I have in this wonderful peace buried deep in my innermost soul while the years of eternity down from the Father above. Sweep over
for my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. I believe when I rise to that city of peace, where the author of peace I shall see. That one strain of the song which the ransom will sing in that heavenly kingdom will be peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Weary soul without gladness or comfort or rest, passing down the rough pathway of time. Make the Savior your friend ere the shadows grow dark, or oh, accept of this peace so sublime. Peace, peace, wonderful peace. From the Father above, sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Let's pray. Loving Lord, we pray for that peace, peace that is beyond understanding, it comes from the Father above. But Lord, we want to make him happy too. So help us to keep in mind this message of obeying your laws. Because in heaven, it's your law that's going to be obeyed by everyone. We want to start now and experience the joy that you have planned for us up there. So go with us now and keep us focused on reasoning together and understanding all the facets of your wonderful law. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.